In this lecture, we continue covering wave-induced forces on structures, Morrison's equation. So what happens beneath the surface? On this diagram, I show a schematic of C waves. And on this diagram, I show the wave height, H. This is the distance from wave trough to wave crest. The wave length, or the distance between two adjoining crests. The water depth, D. And waves are composed of orbiting particles of water. Near the surface, the size of these orbits is the same as the wave height. And the size of these orbits decreases exponentially with depths as we go deeper below the surface. So these orbits closer to the seabed, they have very little energy, while orbits closer to the surface, they have lots of energy. Approximately 95% of energy is contained within the layer between the surface and a depth that is equal wavelengths divided by 4. So within this layer, we have approximately 95% of energy. And if we consider conditions for waves at North Atlantic offshore, we usually should consider different conditions, storm conditions, average conditions, and calm conditions. For storm conditions, we have waves of around wave period 14 seconds, wave height 14 meters, and wave length of 320 meters. And typical North Atlantic wave length is 150 meters. So to extract approximately 95% of energy of this incident wave, a design would be approximately 38 meters deep. And this device would be very expensive to build and optimum depth for most practical devices is somewhere between 4 and 10 meters. To estimate wave-induced force on a structure, we will use Morrison's equation. Depending on your design setup, your structure could be a horizontally installed cylinder or vertically installed cylinder. For example, a cylinder of your tidal current turbine or a cylinder of offshore wind turbine. Let's start with a horizontally installed cylinder. Assume we have a cylinder of length L that is installed horizontally as shown on this slide. So this is our cylinder installed horizontally, direction of flow from left to right, and here we have waves passing above the cylinder. To estimate wave-induced force, we'll use Morrison's equation, and in Morrison's equation, we first need to estimate the cylinder projected area and also cylinder volume. The cylinder projected area would be just the diameter of the cylinder multiplied by length of the cylinder while cylinder volume would be the cross-section area of the cylinder multiplied by length of the cylinder, or pi d squared divided by 4 multiplied by L. So now we can write that the total wave-induced force acting on a horizontally installed circular cylinder is equal drag force plus inertia force. In this equation, we also have instantaneous velocities and also instantaneous accelerations. And to determine this, we would use equations for the kinematics of water particles. And now I have a question for you that I would like you to answer. Does the force acting on a horizontally installed circular cylinder depend on what part of the wave is traveling above the cylinder? For example, wave crest or wave trough? For example, at moment T, we can have wave crest, and at moment T1, we can have wave trough traveling above the cylinder. And our total wave-induced force acting on horizontal cylinder is determined as drag force plus inertia force. And for these two components, we need to determine instantaneous velocities and instantaneous accelerations. And we know that this both instantaneous water particle velocities and accelerations, they're not the same depending on what part of the wave is above your structure. 
and therefore the magnitude and direction of the instantaneous total force will also be different. Under the wave surface, the water particles undergo movements. So how can we estimate instantaneous water particle velocities and accelerations? We can use equations for the kinematics of water particles, as shown on this slide. So here I show you how we can estimate horizontal velocity, horizontal acceleration, vertical velocity, and vertical acceleration. And depending on your wave conditions, if it's intermediate wave, deep wave, or shallow wave, we have a set of equations that we can use to determine instantaneous water particle accelerations and velocities using these equations. I don't show you derivations of these equations, but please know these equations, they follow from linear wave theory and also velocity potential function. Derivation is reasonably complex, therefore I just summarized all the equations in this table and depending on your conditions, you use equations that are applicable for your design. To determine instantaneous velocities and accelerations, you would also need to determine free surface elevation, eta, that depends on horizontal position and also time, t. And this is equal to amplitude multiplied by cosine, and under cosine we have kx minus sigma t, where k is the wave number, or 2 pi divided by wavelengths, and sigma t, Sigma is circular frequency, or 2 pi divided by wave period, and t is just the time. And I show free surface elevation by red line on this slide. And I would like to remind you that uh, our coordinate system is horizontal axis x, z is vertical axis, and zero starts at still water level. So z is negative below still water level. And as you can see, when we have crest above your structure, our free surface elevation would be equal to maximum, which is the amplitude. When we have trough above your structure, our free surface elevation will be equal to minus amplitude, which is the minimum free surface elevation. We also have downwards zero crossing, so this is zero crossing position between downwards between crest and trough and also we have upwards zero crossing between trough and crest and for this i also show that free surface elevation would be equal to zero and here also would be equal to zero and i also show you the positive or negative sign or if any parameter would be equal to zero by using these equations on these slides. So you can see, for example, when we have crest, our horizontal velocity component would be positive, horizontal acceleration would be equal to zero, vertical velocity would be equal to zero, and vertical acceleration would be negative. And for the trough, our horizontal velocity would be negative, horizontal acceleration would be equal to zero, vertical velocity would be equal to zero and vertical acceleration would be positive. So you can use this summary diagram to be able to determine free surface elevations and from here you would be able to also determine uh, instantaneous water particles velocities and accelerations. Now let's consider how we can determine wave induced force on a surface piercing vertical circular cylinder. If the cylinder of length L is installed vertically, then in addition to the wave loading, there is current loading. Assume we have a setup, vertically installed cylinder of length L, diameter D, direction of travel from left to right, then in addition to wave loading, we have current loading. If our current is steady, then there is no inertia force contribution from the current. However, current gives additional drag force. Therefore, total drag force acting on this vertically installed cylinder would consist of two components, which is wave-induced drag and current drag. And we can write that the total drag force is equal. Drag force induced by the wave 
and also drag force created by the current where our v with index w is instantaneous water particle velocities under the wave and v with index c which is our steady current velocity therefore the total force acting on the structure would be equal to total wave induced force plus current force or drag force induced by the current and this is our total wave induced force consisting of the drag force and inertia force let's consider an example we need to calculate the current force on the cylinder of an offshore wind turbine for a steady current with velocity 0.8 meters per second at the water surface and this velocity is decaying approximately linearly to zero at a depth of 50 meters and we can use drag coefficient of 1.5 so our setup is as shown on this slide so we have a cylinder with diameter 0.3 meters and we have steady current which is 0.8 meters per second at the water surface and decaying to zero at z equal minus 50. so this is linear current profile first using the data provided in the question we develop an equation describing current profile we know that velocity is equal to 0.8 when z is equal to 0 and velocity is equal to 0 when z is equal to minus 50. To satisfy this condition, the current profile should look as shown on this slide. u is equal to 0 0.016 multiplied by z and plus 0.8. And we also know that the drag force is proportional to u square. Therefore, we can take the square of each side of this equation and now we can determine the drag force induced by the current and the drag force is equal 0.5 multiplied by density multiplied by drag coefficient multiplied by diameter and now we do integration of u in power 2 over dz where z changing from 0 at the surface to minus 50 at the position where velocity is equal to 0 because here velocity is equal to 0 therefore the drag force below this level would be equal to 0 substituting equation for the u square we can rewrite this equation as shown on this slide and now we do integration because this is simple power function and following equation and describes what the drag force induced by the current would be equal to and substituting the values which are 0 and minus 50 we have that the total current force would be equal to 2.46 kilonewtons in the final example let's consider how you can estimate wave induced force acting on a sphere of diameter d and this is similar to the wave induced force acting on a horizontal cylinder the only difference would be is the projected area and the volume because it would be projected area of a sphere and also volume of a sphere and this is calculated as pi d squared divided by 4 as projected area of a sphere and sphere volume is pi d in power 3 divided by 6 therefore the total wave induced force acting on a cylinder is your drag force plus inertia force this is how you would calculate the wave induced force acting on a cylinder and this is how it compares to the drag force and also inertia force acting on a cylinder so this is our total wave induced force acting on a horizontal cylinder so the only difference is projected area and also the volume of the structure on this slide i would like to summarize how you can estimate wave induced forces acting on structures you can use morrison's equations and this equation is applicable for small structures that are defined when the ratio of representative size of the structure divided by wavelengths is less than 0.2 and our morrison's equation is the total wave induced force is equal to the drag force induced by the wave 
plus inertia force induced by the wave. And we can have a wave-induced force on a horizontal circular cylinder, and this is estimated as drag force plus inertia force. And in this case, our projected area is diameter of the cylinder multiplied by L. And here we have volume over horizontally installed circular cylinder, which is cross-section area of the cylinder multiplied by L. We can also have a cylinder that is surface piercing, vertically installed cylinder. For example, it could be offshore wind turbine. And if we have force acting on this cylinder, we can have a force due to both waves and steady currents. If we have a steady current, then there is no inertia contribution from the current because there is no unsteadiness of the flow and there is only drag contribution from the steady current. Therefore, the total force acting on a surface piercing vertical circular cylinder would be our drag force induced by the wave plus inertia force induced by the wave and plus drag force due to current. And finally, we can also have wave-induced force on a sphere. And this would be similar to our wave-induced force acting on a horizontally installed cylinder. Only the difference it would be how you estimate the projected area and also volume of your sphere.